you're back. Oh, there we go. All right, great. Well, everyone, looks like we have a really great turnout of 32 people in this room. So thank you all for taking the time um, to, to log in this morning. Uh, to, um, today is the defense of Rakshit Katari. So if you came here for any other reason, you're in the wrong room. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've been working with Rakshit for uh, over six years now. And so this is a really, um, I've been looking forward to this day. I'm really proud of what Rakshit has accomplished. Looking forward to what he has to say here today about a robust gaze estimation and classification of natural conditions. Um, uh, so rather than make this too long-winded, Rakshit, are you you ready? Yeah, as uh, as that what I would be. So <laughs> I think you're ready. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thanks Kate, for the introduction, and uh, thank you everyone for. Uh, here, being here as a part of my uh, dissertation. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about my thesis, which is on robust case estimation and classification in naturalistic conditions. Now, how do we perceive the world? Our eyes move from one region of interest to another sequentially. This pattern of eye movements enables us to build an internal representation of the world, which guides our actions and thoughts. Hence, the study of eye movements is a critical component in our understanding of human behavior and how we interact with the world. When the head is kept fixed, eye movements are typically segregated into three basic categories. There are fixations, where the eye remains relatively still, we have saccades, which are rapid eye movements, which allow us to move from one gaze position to another. And we have smooth pursuits, which are slow eye movements utilized when pursuing a moving object. Identifying the correct type of eye movement, its duration and frequency of occurrence are useful features with many applications, some of which I'm going to discuss. Now we can decode the intent of a person based on the object or region one is looking at. You know, for example, if if, you have, if uh, one person is fixating at food items, it might indicate that one is hungry. Eye movements also help us interact with computing devices. With the rising popularity of VR and AR devices, eye movements are used to interact with virtual content. The detection of abnormal eye movements, such as nystigmus, can help diagnose and detect the onset, the onset of neurological diseases. And my personal favorite, eye movements help us decode strategies that humans make while accomplishing tasks. For example, this video shows the work by John Mathis, who is interested in studying eye movements of his subjects tasked to walk over rough land. Eye tracking has been accomplished in a number of ways. One of the early approaches involves attaching a suction cup on the eye. The suction cup has a mirror attached to the front. Eye movements cause the mirror to move along with the eyes. Light reflected from the moving mirror is captured on film, and that further reveals eye movement patterns. Electrooculography involves attaching electrodes to extreme positions around the eye and to measure the electric potential across them. So any eye movements that are made, they modify the potential difference across these electrodes. This technique allows for free movement, but is quite noisy and influenced by external parameters such as lighting and skin resistance. The scleral search coil technique involves the use of contact lens lined with coils. The subject's head is placed in the magnetic field when they have put this uh, lens on. Eye movements induce electric current through the coil, which is then measured and used to record eye movements.
Now, the dual Perkin GI eye tracker is a highly accurate and non-intrusive method of eye tracking. I won't go into too much details about this technique, but I'm happy to talk about this offline. This technique involves measuring the distance between the first and the fourth Perkin G image. Now, all techniques that I've listed here, except electrooculography, severely restricts any movements in subjects. Today, video-based eye trackers are the most popular method to measure eye movements. These devices contain a forward-facing world camera, which captures the scene in front of a person. And they also contain two eye-facing cameras. Eye trackers measure eye movements by tracking features of importance, such as the location, and then map them onto the world camera. Eye movements measured over time are segmented into individual types of movements. We can do this either manually, which is, which is very, very time consuming, or using an automated algorithm, which is prone to error. In order to study human behavior during everyday activities, we need to free our subjects from constraints. Eye movements and respective classifiers are well studied within the literature. However, the rotation of the eyeball occurs within the head, which is free to move. So if I could just divert your attention towards uh, me right now and just do a little uh, test. So if you could just uh, extend your hand forward and keep looking at your thumb. And while looking at your thumb, move your head side to side or up and down. So the movement that you just did looks something like this. The question is, is this a fixation or is this a smooth pursuit movement? This highlights the importance um, of taking the head movement into account. Hence, classification of eye movements in the presence of head movements is vital to understand natural human behavior. The goal of my dissertation is to enable head-free eye tracking for the study of eye and head movements in unconstrained environments. To facilitate inferences of human behavior, we need to be able to estimate gaze under all operational conditions and semantic seg semantically segment them into meaningful categories, such as the, the ones we just discussed, fixations, pursuits, and saccades. In order to do so reliably, we need to make progress on two fronts. We need to develop head-free gaze classification algorithms. And we need to develop robust gaze estimation solutions in unconstrained environments. This presentation will provide a summary of all my contributions towards these goals. First, I will talk about our attempt at tackling the lack of head-free gaze classification algorithms. This effort resulted in the Gaze and Wide project. In order to develop head-free gaze classifiers or to study the interaction between eye and head movements, we require collecting unconstrained gaze movements during natural activities. Previous efforts limited their subjects by seating them or constraining their movements. For example, the work by Barnes restricted their subjects' head movements by only allowing horizontal motion. Virtual studied eye and head movements by seating their subjects on a revolving chair while illuminating targets fixed to the earth or to the chair. More recently, the work by Ian Hauser is the first of its kind to enable natural exploration, but their, but their analysis remains constrained, largely due to technical limitations. Our work consists of placing a calibrated system of IMU, eye tracker, and a stereo camera on a subject while they are accomplishing everyday activities. Activities include indoor walking, playing catch, visual search, 
and team make it. I'm now going to show two examples from the Gazen Wild data set. On the left, you can see a subject attempting to pursue a ball. And you can see the eye movements that this person makes when they're trying to catch the ball. On the right, you can see fixations of a subject on a calibrated depth view as they're walking indoors in the corridors of imaging science. The contributions of the Gaze and Wild project are as follows. We contribute a unique data set of partially labeled eye and head movements from 19 participants acquired in a completely unconstrained fashion. Undergraduate students were hired and trained to manually annotate data into head-free fixations, pursuits, and saccades. We also found that classifiers attained near human performance while detecting saccades and up to 85% while detecting fixations. We also found that classifiers struggle with detecting smooth pursuits. Now, a gaze classification algorithm is only as effective as the measured eye movement signal and is directly dependent on the gaze estimation process. Hence, the gaze estimation pipeline must be reliable. Some environments are challenging and generally result in incorrect or complete lack of gaze estimates. An eye tracker must be able to work under reflections. It should be robust to occlusions. And it must generalize well across various subjects, corrective optics, and platforms such as AR or VR. While the Gaze and Wild project is a stepping stone uh, we require a more broader analysis of human behavior, and that's why we would like to collect data in unconstrained environments. So the study of eye movements in naturalistic, everyday conditions requires engineering better gaze estimation techniques. Now I will talk about our work towards robust gaze estimation. Before I venture into our contributions, I will rapidly summarize the eye tracking pipeline. The general approach towards eye tracking involves using a head-mounted um, eye camera and uh, using a head-mounted world camera and two eye cameras. Acquired eye images are then passed through a pupil segmentation algorithm. The boundaries of the identified pupil are then used to fit an ellipse. Recent approaches produce an improved pupil ellipse fit by estimating an approximate 3D eyeball using pupils detected over consecutive frames. Then, the updated 3D pupil is projected back onto the eye image plane. And in the final step, these pupil ellipses are calibrated to known targets in the visual field by requesting the user to fixate at known locations. As can be seen, the entire process and the entire pipeline relies on the quality of pupil segmentation. Most eye trackers today employ computer vision techniques which generally require manual intervention. I'll now, talk, I'll now holistically describe how the computer vision techniques work. We first usually, uh, these techniques usually involve manually selecting an intensity threshold to identify valid pupil pixels. We then detect edges using canny edge detection. We then look for pupil contours which satisfy certain handcrafted heuristics. Now these heuristics can be based on the, let's say the radius of curvature of the pupil edge or the goodness of fit. And more importantly, how well do different pupil contours agree with each other based on the ellipses that they produce. The advantage of this approach is that it is fairly lightweight and it is very easy to deploy on mobile devices if we write it with efficient code. 
However, one cannot possibly handcraft heuristics for every single scenario. There are many situations, um, such as when occlusions happen, that we cannot foresee and our algorithm will not work, uh, even, even with some predetermined threshold. And usually manual intervention is almost always required in such situations. I'm going to give some examples of where such, uh, such algorithms fail. So here is the output from a widely popular open source framework known as Pupil Labs. On the top left, you will see the pupil detection algorithm of Pupil Labs where it works successfully. However, on the remaining three videos, you can see that the Pupil Labs algorithm has difficulty in identifying pupils. To improve upon previous methodologies, Facebook Reality Labs conducted an international competition called OpenEDS. Since my goals aligned with the objective of this competition, I, along with two other colleagues, took part in the competition. I will now focus on our submission, RITNet, which is a collaborative effort across three laboratories. The OpenEDS challenge consisted of a set of eye images wherein each pixel was annotated into four categories. The goal of this challenge was to produce an automated algorithm which could accurately produce such a semantic map on a held out test set. RIDNet is an encoder-decoder neural network which generates a low-resolution latent representation of an eye image via the encoder. This is followed by convolutional upsampling in the decoder to produce a fine-grained segmentation map of the image. This map segments an eye image into its constituent parts, that is the pupil, iris, sclera, and the skin. The skin is also sometimes referred to as a uh, background. RITNet achieves the best performance on never seen test images collected from different subjects. This is achieved using unique combinations of loss functions and data augmentation schemes. RITNet proposes increasing the importance of pixels at the edges of eye parts. This is achieved by heavily penalizing our network for incorrectly classifying pixels, especially near these eye parts. We find that this improves network performance. RITNet also penalizes a network for producing stray patches. This loss ensures that predicted segments are contiguous regions while improving network performance. To induce robustness to reflective artifacts, we synthetically corrupt images with reflective patterns along with other data augmentation techniques. To summarize the contributions of RITNet, we have shown that a model which is uh, very robust with a low parameter count, it has less than one megabyte, and it operates at almost greater than 300 Hertz, we find that when we train RITNet with appropriate uh, data augmentation schemes, it, it is robust against reflective artifacts. And we also find that RITNet shows state-of-the-art results on the OpenEDS 2019 data set. Uh, here's a picture of me, Ayush, and uh, Dr. Pels when we went to Korea to collect our award. Now, however, RITNet performs poorly when images are heavily blurred. It also has difficulty segmenting eye parts when they are occluded. Poor segmentation masks result in poor ellipse fits, which in turn affects the gaze estimation pipeline. Here is uh, an output from the RIT net uh, when they were trained on pupil labs images. You can see that RIT net does reasonably well in detecting the pupils. Uh, but it struggles a bit in detecting accurate um, iris edges. And occasionally stray patches do come up. While our previous work, RITNet, has shown to be robust against reflections, I will now focus on LSEG, 
our effort towards inducing robustness to occlusions for gaze trackers. In our latest work, LSEG, we propose a modification to the I-part segmentation approach proposed in OpenEDS. Now, instead of tasking a network to segment the constituent I-parts, we propose segmenting direct elliptical structures, as you can see on the right. The advantage of this is that it provides a larger number of supporting pixels around which we can fit accurate ellipses. Now, unlike the RIT net encoder decoder, the LSEC protocol regresses the pupil and iris ellipse axes at orientation while extracting the ellipse centers from the segmentation mask. We provide direct supervision to the latent representation the segmentation output map, and the subsequent pupil and iris centers using a center of mass loss. The center of any convex shape can be described as a weighted summation of its spatial extent. Enforcing this constraint on a network improves the separability of classes. We can see this by taking a horizontal cross-section of the output probability map. Notice how the separability of classes is improved on the figure on the right as opposed to the figure on the left. The figure on the right has been derived when we have used the center of mass loss to condition our network. In summary, the contributions of LSEGS are as follows. The LSEG protocol creates a model which is robust to occlusions. It also shows improved ellipse center estimates over part segmentation approaches on multiple datasets. The LSEG also proposes a novel center of mass loss, which improves center estimates and segmentation performance. Finally, the LSEG protocol and the network that we've developed for this protocol shows state-of-the-art performance on multiple datasets. Here's the performance of our network during occlusions. On the top video, you can see that all the way up until the very final minute when it cannot, uh, until the final frame, when it cannot detect a pupil, LSEC does a fairly good job at estimating where the pupil is. This shows that it is robust towards occlusions. On the bottom video, we can see that the iris, the, the, the iris is almost completely occluded as the, as the subject is looking at different gaze positions. We can see that LSEC does a pretty good job in detecting an entire crisp iris ellipse um, despite occlusion. Now, while both LSEG and RIDNet show state-of-the-art performance on multiple datasets, they both fail to generalize beyond the data that they were trained on. Over here on this video on the left, you can see the performance of RIDNet when it was trained on OpenEDS. Notice how reflective artifacts heavily uh, ruin the, uh, segment, uh, the segmentation output quality of RIDNet. Similarly, LSEG also has a hard time finding an accurate iris because it was trained um, on the EDS abuse. Now, the work presented up until now was done before I submitted my proposal. I will now focus on my current research, which explores generalization of a gaze estimation model. We may not know under what circumstances our model is deployed. Any solution engineered by us must generalize across all expected conditions for an eye tracker. So in the previous video that we just saw, that is a good, that is a good example where RITNet and LSEC failed to generalize onto a certain uh, data set because they were not trained on images of that uh, nature. 
Now a model can be deployed in an indoor or outdoor environment. We may also need to lower image resolution to increase an eye tracker's performance speed. A model is expected to perform well on various image resolutions. And hardware constraints often result in extreme views of gaze-related features such as the pupil. Our solution must be able to handle extreme poses. To create and evaluate a system across a wide range of conditions, we require collecting large amounts of data that spans across gender, race, age, and physiology. Now, this is a challenging task. As an alternative, we opt to utilize existing publicly available datasets. Before proceeding further, I would like to offer a different perspective on how we consider a data set. We generally consider a data set as a collection of images. In this work, we instead consider a data set as a collection of samples drawn from a multivariate distribution. Now, some examples of distribution variables include the gaze angle, the camera pose, the eyelid state, gender, etc. A model is likely to perform well when evaluated on data drawn from an overlapping distribution with the training set. Likewise, it is likely to perform poorly when evaluated on a distribution with little overlap. One solution which becomes immediately apparent is to keep training on as many diverse data sets as possible. We can keep adding more distributions and expand the underlying manifold. Here, each individual distribution represents a different publicly available data set. This is also illustrated by pictures on the left of the slide. If test images are represented by the red circle fall within this expanded manifold, then we can say with certainty that we have benefited by expanding our training distribution. Now, a model has a limited number of learnable parameters which can capture the underlying statistical distribution. Given a test case where the distribution largely overlaps with another, it follows that we utilize a model trained specifically on the overlapping distribution. This ensures that the distribution of importance is well captured by the network parameters. To summarize our intuition, one approach towards generalization is to simultaneously train a network on multiple publicly available data sets. An alternate approach to generalization is to select the best performing model from a pool of data set specific models. A caveat here is that we assume that there exists an approach to finding the best performing model. This is a difficult task because we do not have access to labels during deployment. However, we, as of now, just assume that there is a magical process which can do so. We test the hypothesis that a model trained on multiple data sets can generalize better to new and unseen data. To answer our hypothesis, we acquire nine data sets of varying complexity. Four out of nine data sets are rendered synthetically. While we utilize the synthetic data for training and testing purposes, we avoid making any conclusions using them. Each data set is split into a train and test subset. The test data is drawn from new subjects which will never be utilized during training. While it may seem straightforward that more data could yield better results, analysis of this nature in context of eye tracking remains unexplored. In fact, until recently, we were limited largely due to the unavailability of even a single fully annotated dataset. 
Another significant challenge is that the data sets are partially annotated. To overcome this limitation, we can use our previously published work, LSEC. LSEC offers access to multiple differentiable output parameters. In this work, we optimize the segmentation mask and the subsequent pupil and iris centers. LSEG uniquely allows us to simultaneously train on multiple datasets with partial annotations. So for example, if a dataset only has the pupil center annotated, we would only optimize our model, we would optimize a model only on that. And we would, uh, and we would then not optimize uh, the loss for the iris center or segmentation maps. In experiments which involve training using multiple datasets, we randomly sample three images from each available set and train our network up to 160,000 iterations. In experiments which involve single set training, our batch size consists of 24 images. Now we consider two generalization tests to answer our hypothesis. The leave and out test and the best cross dataset test I will now expand upon these tests in more detail. The leave and out test consists of training a model on all data sets except the one that we are testing on. The best cross data set test consists of evaluating every single model in our pool and finding the best performing model. If the leave and out model outperforms the best cross data set model, then we can safely say that generalization favors a multi-set training approach. Likewise, if the best cross data set model outperforms the leave and out model, then we can safely say that generalization favors finding a model trained on an optimal data set with an overlapping distribution. So here are the results of, uh, of these two tests. Now I know there's a lot going on in this slide, so I'll just spend some time to uh, walk over it. The x-axis are the test data sets and the y-axis denotes the pupil center error in pixels. Naturally, since it denotes the error in pixel units, the lower the error indicates higher performance. So please observe that the two data sets on the left, the blue bars are lower. Whereas for three data sets on the right, the red bars are lower. The blue bars represent the performance of a model trained on all except the test set. The red bars represent the best performing model from a pool of models. Interestingly, our hypothesis is supported by unconstrained data sets collecting outdoors. Data sets collected indoors seem to favor picking a specialized data set specific model. So when we dug into it, we made the assumption that there is a high variability in pupil locations and appearance for outdoor data sets. So we decided to plot this in the form of the distribution of pupil center. Uh, we have plotted that in log scale and the histogram of pupil intensities. In outdoor environments, object of interest may be scattered across the entire visual field, which may result in a broad distribution of pupil center locations. Now, ordinarily, the pupil is a dark elliptical structure when non occluded. A broad range of intensities signifies larger proportions of ambient reflections or occlusions, which in turn increases the variability in pupil appearance. In our previous hypothesis, we consider the situation when one cannot predict the conditions in which a model would be deployed. However, for research and many researchers, uh, we often control or are familiar with the conditions during deployment. So to train a model specific to known conditions, what we often do is we collect a smaller a subset of the data that we actually want to evaluate the model on. And then we train our model on this small subset, and then we deploy it on the larger entire, uh, entire collection of data. The model that we have trained is then expected to generalize to all data which has been collected under the same conditions. 
Acquiring data from subjects, however, is an expensive process. If we collect too much data, we risk wasting time and resources. But if we collect too little data, then we would result in a model which does not generalize. This leads us to our next hypothesis. We hypothesize that a model trained on multiple data sets can mitigate the effects of limited sampling if it exists. To explore this hypothesis, we use two tests, the all versus one test and the within data set test. I will now expand upon each test. In the all versus one test, a model is trained on all available data sets, including the data set that we are evaluating on. This model's performance is then compared against the within data set test. The within data set test involves training and evaluating a model on the same data set. Now, ideally, we would expect that the within data set model gives the highest performance. But we find that if the all versus one model outperforms the within data set model, then we can assume that the data set in question is limited in nature. And the difference in performance is proportional to the bias and that the all versus one test then sets a new benchmark. On the other hand, if the within data set performance is greater than the all versus one performance, then we safely assume that the data set is appropriately sampled. So similar to our previous results, uh, the, uh, or the previous graph, um, I'm, I'm going to walk over the results that we have now. The X axis represents the test data sets, while the Y axis represents the pupil center error measured in pixel units. So naturally lower the score uh, means higher or better the performance. In this figure, observe that the blue bars are lower in the right um, uh, two, in the right two data sets. This indicates that those two data sets are limited and do not generalize to its own test set. The BAT and Swarovski are indoor data sets with limited sampling. To identify the cause for the limitation, we plot the pupil center distribution and find that they are significantly narrower than other well-sampled data sets. This can be attributed to the limited number of subjects and the training images present in these data sets. In conclusion, we find that the multi-set training approach benefits generalization to outdoor data sets. We find that dataset specific models offer better generalization to indoor datasets. Interestingly, if we had to choose one dataset to train uh, our model on, we find that the RITI datasets offers the uh, best generalization. And we also find that the multi-set training approach can be used to identify and mitigate sampling bias. Here are some outputs of generalization from our latest work. Please note that in the videos that you see, not a single image has been taken from the domain, from a subject, or the recording uh, used to show this output. That means the network has absolutely no information from these domains, and it has pieced together this information using the remaining data sets. The video on the left is particularly interesting because you can see this, uh, you can see that the person is wearing contact lens and this contact lens has shifted upwards. And despite the presence of this uh, uh, contact lens and the artifact it creates, uh, the generalized LSEC model does a fairly good job in detecting uh, the pupil and the iris uh, ellipse regions. And on the right, we can see that the LSEC generalized model Fair, it detects these segments uh, fairly well, despite extreme camera views. To summarize the contribution of my thesis, um, the goal of my thesis was to enable head-free eye tracking for the study of eye and head movements in unconstrained environments. So in order to do so reliably, we had to make progress on two fronts. We had to develop head-free case classification algorithms 
and uh, we, we had to develop robust case estimation solutions in unconstrained environments. So the contributions of my thesis address these two issues. The first contribution, the Gaze and Wild project, is a data set of labeled iron head movements. Uh, and we conducted many experiments uh, with different temporal classification algorithms. To, in our attempt to solve the uh, reliable gaze estimation in unconstrained environments, our first work is RITNet, which is an efficient convolutional neural network, uh, which achieves state-of-the-art performance on the open EDS data set. We showed that using appropriate or data augmentation schemes, RITNet, has, uh, RITNet can be robust against reflections. It is a lightweight model, and it works at greater than 300 hertz. And ne my next work uh, is the ELSIC protocol, uh, which is a unique uh, ellipse segmentation protocol. So in this work, I propose to the community that it is better to segment elliptical structures instead of individual eye parts. And in doing so, our model is robust towards occlusion. And in my latest round of work, uh, the LSEC generalized, uh, generalized, uh, generalized LSEC, um, in this work, we provide uh, valuable insights to the community regarding generalization for eye tracking solutions. So uh, I would like to uh, move towards the end of my uh, dissertation by sharing my insights for future research. And this is inspired by a very uh, quote that I really uh, like. It's the day we stop looking is the day we die. It's by Al Pacino, one of my favorite movies. Um, so one of my predictions for the future research, which I would like to continue at some point, uh, is that we, as of now, all our models operate frame by frame. They take in an incoming frame, and they predict the segmentation map, and they produce an output. However, there are many times when the eye is completely, when the eye image is completely degraded and we have absolutely no information uh, that we can rely upon. So in such cases, uh, we, uh, it, is, it is worth exploring a research path where we can use temporal information or the pattern in which eye has been moved in the previous uh, 10 or maybe 30 frames to predict future frames. Uh, the latest round of work shows that much work needs to be done for generalized, generalized uh, solutions. Uh, but, but in my opinion, uh, part of this uh, part of this can be achieved using a part hardware and a part software solution. Uh, I feel that small changes in the hardware can save a lot of load on software, and 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 using a combination of good software uh, models and minor changes in the hardware we can achieve uh, complete generalization. Um, I also feel that event cameras are the future of eye tracking. And event cameras are these uh, neuromorphic cameras, uh, which are really fast and they consume low battery uh, power. And finally, I think currently eye trackers use calibration. Uh, but I feel that the eye tracking community should move towards uh, a calibration-free system so these are just my opinions and my humble opinion for the uh, for the research uh, for the community, uh, and I hope they can benefit from that. Um, I would certainly like to research this going forward. Now. Uh, so some of my other contributions include a weekly supervised, physically unconstrained gaze estimation project. Uh, this was uh, accepted in uh, CVPR 2021 as an oral submission, uh, even though it's not part of my uh, dissertation. And the other project, and actually I'm really proud of this, uh, which was largely done by uh, Nathan, a student uh, who did his master's here, is the RID eyes project, where we uh, rendered eye images so that we can make more robust and uh, better models. In fact, uh, and, and it actually it stands testament to how good it is because RID eyes does produce the best uh, uh, cross data set performance in my latest round of research. Uh, some of the experiences I've accumulated over uh, over these years is uh, I, I did an internship with Magic Leap uh, with Kamran, and that you can see on the bottom left figure, and that's Yo-Yo, who was my mentor back then. Uh, I've also experienced uh, by being an adjunct faculty at RID, where I taught introduction to computer vision to a bunch of students. Uh, interestingly, this the picture that you see is when I had given a... <laughs> a midterm test to my students 
the trick over there there was that they were allowed to discuss to solve the problem so they had a lot of fun during the exam um and during my internship uh, unfortunately it was during covid time so i don't have nice pictures to show but the most notable thing is that i decided to go bald and uh, i decided to share that with you guys today uh thank you uh, for your time uh, i'll quickly take a few minutes to thank some of my um uh, benefactors my loved ones and well wishes well wishes um so first and foremost i want to thank gabe uh gabe you're awesome you really are awesome you gave me an opportunity uh you believed in me and you trusted me uh with something this important and i couldn't have accomplished this without you i would really like to thank my committee who has always been there uh whether i'm stuck on technical problems uh life advice guidance whether in writing um especially reni he's been there with me at like 1 a.m in the night writing stuff <laughs> um uh jeff and chris have helped me with life advices uh, when i've needed them the most um i would also like to thank jim and dave they have been uh very valuable supporters during uh my phd especially jim and our uh conversations regarding color science in fact he and uh, talking to him has helped me find my current job um and dave who has helped me uh get unstuck during many issues during my uh, thesis and in this slide even though kamran is not part of my committee uh he's like an older brother to me and he has guided me and he's been an influential part of my life uh and my phd so he belongs over here hmm. i cannot express how grateful i am to my family my phd is as much their sacrifice and effort as it is mine uh shikha my beautiful and lovely partner has been my best friend with me and uh, and has been part of my journey uh from the very beginning uh my mother has been a constant source of inspiration comfort uh and a voice of love when everything appeared impossible and bleak uh, my father has been a moral compass and a strong support when times were tough and my sister has been important and uh, and relevant in reminding me that it is good to have fun and to relax from time to time i'm happy to announce that she has started learning a thing or two about eye tracking uh and i would also like to thank cookly my cat uh, our cat <laughs> for diligently waking me up at 5 am every morning uh my achievements are built on the foundations of friendship and my roommates are a testament to that um anish sanket and ravi have walked this journey with me and i and and i really could not have done this without them and a huge shout out to all my friends and collaborators over the years you guys are awesome and lastly a big 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 thank you to the entire imaging science department this place is filled with the most awesome bunch of nerds that i have ever met i love all of you um and uh thank you i would uh, i would like to take any questions from you guys at this point um uh, and uh thank you for your time Great, great. Thank you, Rakshit. Okay, uh, so the way this works is yes, now, so now there's a, a brief period of time for public questions, question from the public, and then after that, we'll kick the public out so and, and kick out Rakshit so that the faculty committee can discuss Rakshit's uh, defense. Jeffrey, give me a strange look. And well, then, we, don't, uh, we don't kick Rakshit out right away. We have some more okay. time to question him afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot. We don't kick him out right away. eventually we kick him out and then uh and then um and then and then we bring him back in but uh okay so time for some questions from the public um let me start this off with a question i got uh that was submitted by alex orobia but his mic was not working or is not working and so um he was unable to ask it himself so it actually this is from alex okay uh He asked how sensitive was RIT net's performance with respect to the design of the architecture did um and how did you tune the number of layers and units and maps per layer initialization scheme optimization setup etc so how sensitive was RIT's net performance to all these parameters and just the design that 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 that's that that's a good question and we we actually so in order to win the competition the smallest of improvements counted uh 
Um, so it was, it was a lot of this was guided by informed decisions as we made changes. We saw improvements. Sometimes we saw deteriorations, and then we had to backtrack and then uh, fine tune our models. Um, in terms of the network architecture, we found that RITNet is. Uh, you can change the architecture, you can modify it, you can increase the number of channels, reduce it. It does not change the performance very much. But what does change the performance and what heavily affected it was the loss functions and the data augmentation schemes. Um, but we also found, and this is one of the models that we that we experimented with, we, we also experimented with an R-glass surface structure, like uh, encoder decoders back to back. And rather than perform well, we actually, that was a poorer performance than a single encoder decoder network. So uh, to answer your question, a single encoder decoder uh, without any any fancy extra networks after, after the output uh, was enough and it did a very good job. If we, if we expanded the number of channels, the size and the layers, or even the initialization schemes, uh, we didn't find much uh, change to the performance that we got. Uh, we did not experiment with different initialization schemes. We used, I think, uh, the savior or the uh, initialization. I'll have to check up on that. Uh, but the thing which affected our performance the most was data augmentation uh, and loss functions. Thank you, Rakshi. Seems like a, a good thorough response. There's time for questions from other members of the, the public. Uh, so you can raise your hand and I'll call on you if you have a question to ask. Sorry, Dave, I don't know how to raise your hand. That's fine. Can I ask a question? Of course you can. Yes. Yeah, I have two questions. First one was about LSEC. Uh, you showed us a slide with center of mass loss that was somehow uh, injected into latent variable control. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Sure. So I'll just get back to the slide in question. Yeah. So since we were proposing to segment direct ellipses, one of, the, uh, one of the ideas that we have is, um, in order to predict an ellipse, a network could, could have a probability map, uh, which was uneven. It could predict certain regions higher and certain regions uh, lower. It could be more confident in some regions and poorly confident in the other. This was because the loss functions inherently are pixel to pixel based losses. By but, but, but we have an extra piece of information that we could leverage, that all our segmentation outputs are ellipses. And if I weight the pixels which belong to a certain class by the probability map, then the weighted summation of their locations should be the center of mass, right? Because, uh, because for any convex structure, the, the center will always be the uh, center of mass uh, of, of all the points within it. So when we so when we put that particular constraint, what we do is we go in, we take the set, we take the segmentation output. So let's say we take the pupil over here. The pupil is the yellow uh, ellipse that you see, and we simply find its center of mass. And by set, when we use um, the uh, what's the word the arc softmax, the soft arc max to find the center of mass, and then once we get that, and that's a differentiable value. Uh, we we also back uh, we also back propagate that with the uh, ground truth pupil center. So uh, did, did that did that help? Yeah, that was interesting. And I also I have a question about so uh, you uh, had an experiment about multi set comparing multi set uh, training to even out when you show us in a uh, pupil center prediction. So. Um, you showed how the, the strategy, you know, the how the strategy of selection the data set uh, influence the uh, outcome, but I didn't get why sometimes, like on the left side of the board, you had cross section. Oh, okay. So, so if you would go to that side, I can ask you. 
So you, you see on the left side, you have the tendency of this uh, data set behave, you know, like if you choose a multi set, you have a multi set of even better predictions. But on the right side, you have three data sets that give you by using multi set worse prediction. And I didn't catch why was the difference. Uh, yeah. So the, the so th this was a more of a find, and the find was that the data sets on the left, they were outdoor data sets. The images in these data sets had significant amount of reflections. Uh, and, and when we have the, and, and, and also that pupil location was, uh, had a significantly wide distribution as opposed to the data sets on the right, which were collected indoors. So this was, this was a thought and, and, and we wanted to go down and explore more that why, why this would happen. So, so what we did was um, we went in and checked our assumptions about this outdoor and indoors. And then what we find is that the data sets which were outdoors had a significantly wider distribution of pupil locations. And that's why when we have multi-set training, we can piece together and add uh, a, larger, uh, a larger distribution by having multi-set training, which helps generalize it better to these data sets, to LPW and the full data sets. Also, the LPW and full data sets have significantly wider variability where the pupil belongs. So pixels which belong to the pupil, you can see that the intensity pattern is a significantly wider variability as compared to indoor data sets. So I think these two, re uh, these two reasons is why uh, multi-set training helps because it, it, it gives a better representation of, uh, uh, of the pupil pixels and it also gives a broader locations of pupil regions um, um, by combining different data sets. I have a question okay. over here. Yeah. So is it because the LPW and full does not have segmentation mask that is creating this? Can, can the training of a multi-set data set without the segmentation mask have such impact? Because LPW and full does not have segmentation maps, right? But open yeah. EDS is similar to BAT, I guess. And they have a segmentation map. And since you are doing a joint training of segmentation map and pupil center, it, there might be a case that the segmentation map is helping the pupil center estimation. But if you are just using the pupil center estimate, then that is affecting the system or the model. Can that be the case? So in the, in the data sets on the right, uh, just, just a minor correction there, but that's a good question, by the way, I, 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 I need to think about it. So the open EDS is the only data set with labels, full segmentation labels. The PAT has the uh, pupil sent, the, it has a pupil ellipse, I believe, but we don't have the iris, so we cannot use the segmentation losses. Um, but you are comparing the pupil center, right? Not the iris yeah. center. So. Yeah, yeah, but for training, we use all the losses. So, uh, so your question is that does the does the lack of segmentation annotation uh, improve performance, and is that the reason why it happens? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Mm, I don't, I, I, I don't think so. I think it is because of the wider variability that we could expect. Because what the the advantage of multi-state training uh, is to expand the distribution, the training distribution that we have. It. And the only place where we would see this advantage is on a test set, which has an equivalent wide distribution to be tested on. So we pretty much went in and I checked the, uh, checked which of these data sets had a wider distribution and a wider variability. And we found that the LPW and the full data set does. And this also co uh, collaborates well with the um, uh, with, with the results that we see that the multi-state training approach is better to generalize on them. So I don't I, I, I don't think so, but maybe I haven't understood the uh, question. Better. So the another question follow-up question is: RITIs 
has the pupil centers, which is more diverse, like LPW and full, right? So how does that? that, that that's a great question. Comment? Yeah, because in fact, RIDI is because it's so broad and it's it's so diverse. Uh, in 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 all cases where the uh, where we are finding a single data set, a single model which best generalizes, RITIs, model strain RITIs perform the best. Generalization, open EDS, LPW, in fact, pretty much all data sets, uh, RITIs outperforms remaining other data sets. So that, that's a testament to how, how uh, good the distribution within it is. Thank you. Any, we could take one more public question. Okay, then it sounds like now's the time uh, for the committee to uh, to ask the public to leave so that we can ask Rashid, uh, Rashid questions in private. So thank you to everyone who took the time to show up this morning. Um, I. Uh, Really appreciate you guys showing your support to Rakshit and or just coming to learn more about eye track pupil segmentation. It's also great to see uh, the family members in the camera. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so uh, at this point, I think we should request them to leave, or should I just start kicking people out? Uh, yeah, so if the public could please log off at this point, that would be great. If not, I'll create a breakout room. That's probably the fastest way. Um, I'm going to create a breakout room and invite uh, and invite Jeff and Rennie, just in case some people may have walked away from their computer. So give me a second here. Rakshi, can you um, hit um, end record, please? Okay. Thank you. Stop.